If you didn't notice, every song was about being thankful. And if we aren't doing it already, every thought, every breath that we breathe should be immersed in thankfulness to God, shouldn't it? Turn to Luke chapter 17. We're going to see the power of God over the physical body. And then we're going to see even more wonderful glory given to God as a heart changes and gives glory and honor and gratitude to God. Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Many things stir my heart reading that text, studying through it. And right off the bat, leprosy. Leprosy, man, that just, that has to grip our attention if we know anything about this awful disease. It's a disease that so easily and aptly can be used as an illustration for what sin in the heart looks like. Leprosy slowly eats away at the skin and muscle tissue of the body. It is utterly painful. It's putrefying. It's contagious, extremely contagious, and it's deadly. Oh, can you find a, a better way to describe sin? All oh, the pain and the collateral damage that sin causes, not just to you, but to others around you. It's contagious. Sin leads to more sin. It's putrefying, it's rotten. And it leads to destruction. It's deadly. But today, we are going to look at something that, to me, is even more foul in the light of Jesus and his sacrifice for us, his death and resurrection, more foul than the curse of leprosy, and that is ingratitude, ungratefulness. We have in our text a very telling snapshot of humanity. Ten men, ten souls, ten people were infected with a terminal disease. Ten men were delivered by the power and by the love of God. Amen. But only one returned to praise and worship at Jesus' feet and to give him his undying thankfulness and gratitude. What a snapshot of humanity. How many lives has the Lord directly touched and delivered and protected and ministered to? Yet how many will return and say, Thank you, oh my Father, for all you've done for me. I give you praise. I give you honor. I give you everything. 10%. One out of 10. 
Who were these men? Well, obviously they were lepers. You didn't just have leprosy. You, didn't, you weren't who you are, and you had leprosy. If you had leprosy, you were a leper. That was your identity. These men were lepers, meaning they were cast out from their family, from their friends, from society as a whole. As a leper, there's the door. You're out of here, out of the city gates. You must stay away from everyone. It was a horrible curse to fall upon you. These men being lepers, it appears from Jesus' question here, were there, were there not more? Were there not nine others? And only this one Samaritan, this foreigner that returned? It appears from that that the others were probably Jews. And we read that Jesus was traveling to Jerusalem. He was traveling from Capernaum, which is about 80 miles away. And if you're coming from Capernaum, going to Jerusalem, you have to go through Samaria and Galilee. And we read that as Jesus was entering one of the villages on his journey to Jerusalem in Samaria, as he was entering the city, he heard ten men crying from afar off. They're not allowed in the city, but they see Jesus coming, and he's just about to walk in. And this is their chance. They cry from afar off, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Pay attention to how they addressed him. Jesus called him by his name, and his name means Yahweh. Saves. Yahweh, God, is salvation. The Lord saves. And they call out his name. They heard of this man who works miracles. They've heard this man who speaks like no other man speaks. And they say, we are calling out to you because we believe that God saves. And God saves through you, Jesus. They called him out by name. And then they called him out by title. Master, though they didn't know the full depth of that title for him. Lord, supreme authority, master, the one who saves, the one who we are to give all to. Jesus, have mercy on us. These men properly identified Jesus as their Lord, but only one properly honored him and served him as their Lord and Savior. That's the difference. They were equally needy, equally condemned men, cursed with the disease, cursed with shunning from society. They were equally desperate. And they all shared the same answer to prayer. These men were very similar. But again, 10%, only one returned. Only one of them was transformed. 10 were healed, one was transformed. It is the heart that is transformed by the matchless grace of our Lord. That heart is truly grateful before God. Hear the astonishment in Jesus' words. Let's look at verses 17 and 18 again. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? There's astonishment. There's, there's a hurting there in Jesus' words. Where are the rest? Do they understand what has just happened? Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priest. And what that meant was, you don't come back into society if, in fact, the Lord does work on your behalf and he heals you of that leprosy and those horrendous spots 
go away and the, the putrefying smell, your skin is restored. If that happens and the Lord touches you, you still weren't allowed to come back in to society until you showed yourself to the priests. And the priests would inspect you and say, yes, the leprosy is gone. Well, these men, while they were fully covered, as they were, coming to Jesus as they were, as lepers, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. That's a bold statement. You don't show yourself to the priest unless there's no leprosy. But he says, in your state right now, you go. You go to the priest, to the one who will represent you before God. And it says, as they were going. Not when they got there, as they were going. That means for the first 100 paces, for the first 200 paces, for the first two miles. I don't know how far they had to go. But for the first leg of their journey, they still had leprosy. And I don't know if it happened little by little or if it just, boom, it was gone. But it says, as they went, their leprosy left them. It required faith. This is belief in Jesus as Lord. Jesus as healer, as deliverer. That proves all ten of these men exercise faith in Jesus. Let's not take away that from the nine that didn't return. They put faith in the word of the Lord. How many people won't even go that far? How many people won't humble themselves? How many people say, what? Go show myself to the priest. Do you see how rotten I am? I'll be rejected. I'll be shunned. I'll be ridiculed. It took faith to do this. All ten exercise true faith. And yet, Jesus says, were there not ten that were cleansed? Where are the nine? I look at this world. I look out at those who take the name of Christ. And I hear Jesus' words as he looks out and says, Where are the nine? Where are my followers? Where are the ones that I've touched, that I've delivered, that I've rescued from the curse, the leprosy of sin, where are the ones who will come and offer me praise and thanksgiving and do so publicly so that others come running to me to be delivered? Where are the public praises of God's people whom he's redeemed from the midst of this crooked and perverse generation? When this man fell on his face, and worshipped at Jesus' feet. It says he fell on his face. That was the ultimate sign of humility and honor. Falling down. I am nothing, Lord. I give you all praise. I give you all the thanks in my heart. I am so grateful. I lay down at your feet. When he did that and worshipped, I guarantee you it wasn't in a vacuum it wasn't in private, because wherever Jesus was, there were those around him. There, was, there were others present. This was a public praise service that this man gave Jesus. Public praise to God should never be a hindrance to our worship to him. It shouldn't matter. What others think. It should be so easy to say, praise the Lord. He saved me from that, uh, that accident I almost had when that guy changed lanes coming the other way on Highway 42. It almost hit me. I've had one of those moments. Ah! Praise God. You share it with others. Oh, the Lord saved me from a terrible accident. I could have died right there. Or, oh, the Lord's been so good to me. I've had such a good week. How's your week going? Public praise, public gratitude should never be a hindrance, never be a hiccup at all in our daily communion with the Lord. It shouldn't matter if we're in private or in public. We should be a grateful people, shouldn't we? At all times. Gratitude, then, bears the clear mark of salvation. 
Hear that again. Receive it. Gratitude bears the clear distinction, the clear mark of one who is saved. Can we really be grateful for something that we've never received or that we don't believe in in the first place? Thankfulness for all that God has accomplished for me to be saved should be the driving, the driving factor behind everything I do, behind everything that I am. He is my propitiation for sin, my substitute. He took my torture. He took my condemnation. He took my public shame, my agony, my desperation, my leprosy. And he cleansed me. Because I know and believe this to be true, it should drive me to the place of grateful worship every day of my life. Is there a place for me to complain when someone says, how's your day today? <laughs> Let me tell you how rotten my day is. Guilty. I'm guilty of that. Is there room for comp complaining and grumbling? I don't know. I'm thinking as a leper, this man had nothing. We don't know how, how long these lepers were out there. Their clothes were probably worn out. Their shoes, if they had any, were long gone by now. Maybe, maybe this man who returned to Jesus was barefoot. Maybe he was walking. I doubt he was walking. I bet he was running. What does our text say? And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice. Glorify God and fell down. You don't just walk casually and say, hey, you're, he's running. And I'm sure if he's got bare feet, he's, he's running over all kinds of obstacles and sharp rocks. And ow, I can't walk barefoot. I have tenderfoot. I'm a tenderfoot. But I'm sure he had all kinds of reasons to say, man, this is a long run back. <sighs> Maybe I'll do this tomorrow. Is there ever a reason to say, no, I won't immediately right now offer God praise? I have an opportunity to do so publicly. Oh, this is going to be even better. There's never a reason to grumble and to complain in light of Jesus as our propitiation for sin. It's the mark of salvation. True gratitude is hard to bottle up. In fact, if, if we truly have our eyes open to our Savior's love for us, we can't keep it in. This is what... The psalm has said in 103, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, every last drop. Bless his holy name, all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, so that your flesh is renewed like a baby from leprosy. My leprosy of heart is cleansed, it's purged, and I have shown myself to the high priest, my king, and I am cleansed, I am restored, and I will praise him. Yes, I will praise him more and more. I hope you have your Bible. Let's put this account for a second aside. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Ten chapters back. This just, this just sheds more light upon the astonishment that we should share with Jesus when only one returned. Luke 7 36 through 50. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood, as his, stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. 
Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman that this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, I love that. He thought it in his heart, and Jesus answered him. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, the customary greeting of the day. You didn't even greet me in the way that I should be greeted. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, another thing you would do to honor such a man, such a guest as Jesus. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Same thing he said to the leper. All ten were, were cleansed, but only one heard this. Your faith has made you well. Faith is only truly rewarded when a, our, a heart of love is born in us. And love just naturally goes. It runs to gratitude. It runs to thankfulness. If we love our Father, we love His Son who He sent for us and the Spirit who is given to us, then that love naturally speaks and expresses gratitude. From this account I just read in Luke 7, we see that gratitude is inescapably linked to our understanding or to our perception of who God is and who we are, of who God is and what he's done for us. Gratitude is linked to our perception. Jesus said, to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. He who thinks he's, he's been forgiven much will love much. What do you perceive? How do you perceive the death of Jesus Christ for you. Because even if there's anyone in this room who has not surrendered their life to Jesus, he still died for you. He still took the stripes for you. He didn't suffer any less for you just because you haven't honored him as your king. Let alone those who have put their faith in him. Should there not be Continual daily thanksgiving coming from our lips, coming from every part of us. How do you perceive what has taken place since Jesus came and died for you? Ingratitude is easily spotted, isn't it? You, can, you can't hide it, it stinks. It smells. It's a putrefying smell. People can smell the aroma, the aroma of ingratitude in a room. It stinks. It's corrosive. It eats away at everyone who's involved. Not just the one who's ungrateful themselves, but the one they're ungrateful to and those who witness the ingratitude. And it closes the doors to all kinds of opportunities. Shuts down. And the kingdom of this world 
We just finished talking about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world bears the indelible mark of ingratitude. Every, everywhere you look in the world, in the kingdom of men, ingratitude. Ingratitude. Unthink, an unthankful heart. This world is not moved by the stripes on Jesus' back. They're not, they, they don't take notice of the drops of blood that gush from his side. It's unavoidable when someone is ungrateful. Can't hide it. But neither can you hide true gratitude. True gratitude and thanksgiving to God cannot be bottled up. It gives off a sweet aroma of grace and devotion and love to God. It like ingratitude, it is contagious. It spurs others on to be thankful, to seek, to honor God, to worship Him. It is certainly possible to receive a physical healing from God and yet not receive the greater spiritual blessing. Ten lepers, only one came back to honor God. What is motivating us, as I bring this to a close, what is motivating us to serve him? If you claim to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you've pledged your heart to him, what is driving that pledge? What is driving your faith? Is it fear? Fear of judgment or hell? Fear is indeed useful because it is the beginning of wisdom, but it really isn't a good motivator. It's not a saving motivator. Fear doesn't drive us to the place of worship. Is it merely habit or tradition? This is what's been handed down to me. This is what I do. This is what I've always done. Get up on Sunday morning, get dressed, go to church, sing the songs, listen to the preacher, then do it again a week later. This is how I was raised. This is how we do it. Is that, is that what's behind your faith in God? Or is it a heart of gratitude? I'm speaking from my heart. It, it breaks me to speak of gratitude because I know, I look back, I see times when I have not shown that gratitude to my Lord as I should. And I look around and I sure see a void where God has done such amazing things in people's lives and yet they're known for their grumbling. They're known for anything but gratitude. All of these men prayed, but only one praised. Prayer without praise is ingratitude. Pray to God, Lord, help me. Everyone cries out to God. Even a, an atheist in a foxhole cries out to God. You can pray, but not return the praise. Let's not just be a praying people. Let's be a praising people. Thanking God. Even when the answer that we have been seeking has not been delivered yet. Even when our prayer is heard, and yet Daniel, it wasn't time. There was more things to do. The answer couldn't come even when years and years and years and years later. It is finally then that the answer is revealed. In the meantime, are we appraising people? Only a minuscule fraction of those who pray ever return the proper praise to, Lord, to the Lord. Let's not be among the 90%. Thankfulness does have a cost. This man had to return. He went back. I don't know how far the journey was, but he came back and he humbled himself on the ground, honoring God. He humbled himself and he did so publicly. Thanksgiving has a cost. But, it, but it's nothing compared to the cost that Jesus paid. 
to save me. One man who expresses his thanksgiving to God brings incredible glory to God. Imagine what ten people can do. Imagine if there's 20 people here that have been cleansed of the leprosy of their soul. Imagine how incredible it is if all 20 come and fall down and publicly praise God. That's the church. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Yes, one light can shine brightly for him, but the body of Christ, a city on a hill, that is what changes the world. Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. We are made whole in gratitude. We are made whole and complete. It's only natural that we return our honor and praise to God. We were created to worship him. We were created to have that sweet communion. It's only natural we're made whole. Our faith makes us whole as we come and render to him the praise due him. I just, this, this has largely just been an, an appeal from my heart to, to all of us to honor God, to thank him and We've already had a time of praising. And I just feel, I, I, just want, I need to open it up again. If there's anything that was stirred in your heart as a result of the word that we read today, or just something you just gotta, you gotta express. And I, I'd say, especially for those, or maybe those of us who don't typically speak out, just, not that I'm not trying to shame anyone into this, of course. Just that the Lord moves you. But is there something that you'd like to share? Is there some gratitude before we wrap this up that you would like to express right now? I can testify that Julia lives with chronic pain in her back and her neck. She has good days, but she has many days where it just, it just shuts you down. And I also know, as you know as well, Julia has no hesitation to publicly thank and praise God. What a beautiful thing gratitude is. Oh, praise the Lord, sister. Anyone else? There's a whole lot to complain about in our world, right? Right now, what would be more stark than to be a people who don't complain, but rather praise God for the good that he's doing in our life? <clears throat> you think you can, you're not going to stand out? We need to practice on each other. Start in your home. Start expressing your thanksgiving to those who are closest to you. Your neighbor. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Anyone else?
only are you still here, but so many of you know, but Reuben still meets, you're still meeting, right? With a group of those who are going through cancer, prostate cancer. And he meets with them, and, and I know Deborah, too, has, has met with uh, the women, the wives, and they're ministering to these people who have this, it's a death sentence, and only God can heal. Praise the Lord. He's doing a mighty work in your life. Okay, I'll do that too. How can I thank God enough for my kids? <laughs> oh, I tell you what, we've gone kind of long. I know the kids are in the back. How about we just stand? I'll just close us in prayer. Let actually, Don, can you just close us in prayer from where you're at? Let's just let's have this be a new start to us being a praising, thankful people.